Okay, we are ready to go. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. My name is Adam Greco and I head up the SDEC or the Search Discovery Education Community. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, we are a free community of a couple, I think we're up to almost 3,500 people across the globe, uh, focused on giving free educational sessions around digital analytics, digital marketing, and so on. Uh, we have had about 43, I think, past sessions, and so we're really starting to hit our groove here. Um, this is a little bit of a different one uh, time-wise for us because our speaker, Christy, is from Australia, which is really cool and really exciting. We're excited to have Christy here. So I will be working behind the scenes. If you have any questions or technical issues, you can use the chat function of Zoom to ping me, and I'm happy to help out. Or if you have any questions about the SDEC in general, you can ping there. Um, if you have questions for Christy during the session, please use the Zoom Q&A feature instead of the chat because all the Q&A stuff there is a, gets to a nice report where Christy can follow up afterwards if there's anything we don't have time to get to today. If somehow you are in this session and you are not a member of the SDEC, it is free to join and I will be posting a link to join in the chat. Um, and you can forward that to any of your coworkers. We have unlimited capacity in the group. And one little note, I'll tell you, uh, we do have a Slack group that is part of the SDEC community. For some crazy reason, only 70% of you are in the Slack group, which means that 30% of you are missing out on uh, seeing 40 plus recordings of past webinars. So I'd highly recommend that you join the Slack group. If you don't know how to do that, you can email me at sdec at searchdiscovery.com. And I will also be putting that in the chat. So thank you again for joining. Happy New Year for those of you who, who this is your first session. And now, Christy, I will hand them off to you. They are all yours. Thanks so much for presenting. And I'll talk to you when we get back to the QA. All right. Thanks, Adam. Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present as part of the SDEC. Uh, so today, my presentation is around Adobe Analytics Report Builder. Uh, Report Builder is an add-in for Excel. So if you don't use Adobe Analytics and you don't use Excel, probably the wrong session. But if you do, what I'm hoping is that you'll take away from here a couple of ideas or things that you hadn't thought of, which will help you in your report building in the future. Um, I thought I'd say hi on video, but I will stop the video when we're going through the presentation, just to make sure we don't have any weird internet hiccups. Okay, so on the agenda today, um, I have got, uh, I actually threw in one extra tip this morning, which I'm hoping we're going to have time to get through. But these are the tips that I have. Um, just for my background, I won't go into a very long introduction, but I've been using Adobe Analytics, I think now for about 14 years and Report Builder for, oh, I'm not quite sure how long I've been using Report Builder, not that long, but for a while on and off, both in roles when I was in client side and then with some of the clients that I work with at the moment. So I've got six, maybe seven if we get there, um, kind of themes that I want to talk about and really hope that some of these will be quite useful. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail around how Excel works itself or even parts of Report Builder, but I'm happy to either follow up in the chat or follow up post this session. Um, I wanted to make sure I could spend the time going through all the ideas and if there's some detail that you're missing, happy to chat about it later. So my first tip, uh, and probably my most important tip, is organise your data. So what I recommend is to have four separate spreadsheets in your workbook. The first one uh, I like to call data extract, and this is the sheet that has all the extracts from Report Builder. So as you know, you can build a little query in Report Builder, and it will uh, print out all the data that you need. So in here, you can see that there's three separate queries, one that starts in cell A1, one that starts in cell E1, and one that starts in H1. In my actual practice workbook, I've got a whole stack that, that move across horizontally. But I recommend that you put all your extracts in one, one particular uh, sheet. Second sheet is the data table. So this is essentially, um, links back to the data extract. And there's a couple of reasons why I like to do this. Um, firstly, it allows you to use Excel formulas to change or transform your data. 
So you can see in the very first um, particular extract that I have here, really, really simple. In cell A2, it's just looking at cell A2. But in cell B2, I have a formula that is actually doing a couple of things. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So having it in a separate table, a separate sheet will allow you to do any kind of transformation or data manipulation. Uh, the other big one is that it lets you overwrite data that might be incorrect. Um, I'm sure all of you realize that uh, the data is never perfect, data gets dropped, data gets lost, it might be um, wrong or implemented wrong. This way you can actually just type straight over it and you don't have to worry about the query refreshing the wrong data. Um, this has been a lifesaver for me numerous times and will just make your life easier. Uh, third sheet I have is what I would like to call an information sheet. Uh, and this has a bunch of information that I will reference in my report that I, that I build. Things like dates, um, report week start date, end date. This is really important if you're doing weekly um, data pools. You might have a list of products or countries or brands or variables or all of the above. I'd like to have a separate sheet in one place to control this. And then finally, you'd have a summary sheet. So this is this is what your report would like. So I've got a very, very basic report that I'll kind of take you through during this, this presentation. So I call this summary, you might call it dashboard, whatever you want, I have the final presentation layer. So always highly recommend um, to set it up like this. Second tip. Uh, setting up the different dates. Adobe's got some really good options around dates and so does Excel. So when you combine those together, you can do some really cool stuff that is really quite hard to do in analytics workspace and was impossible to do in reports and analytics or whatever it was pre-analytics workspace. So you've got four different types of dates here in, in Adobe. You've got preset, so example last week, fixed dates, 1st of January 2021 to 17th of January, uh, rolling kind of dates you can set up and a date from the cell. So you can link to a particular cell in a worksheet. So I'll go through a couple of examples of what I like to use. First one, set up your financial year. I'm almost positive that most of you here will have to do something related to a financial year report. In Australia, it's generally the 1st of July to the 30th of June. Um, don't pay too much to this screenshot. Um, Heads up, this is in an American format and I always get this wrong when I type it in. Uh, but essentially set up your, your financial year or whatever reporting kind of period that you, um, that you need. And another tip that I also have here, you can see in the red box, save the date, you can save this so that you can use this again when you're building up other reports. So that's probably the most useful fixed date report. I don't use fixed dates for anything else. I'm sure there's other use cases. That, that people may have, but uh, financial year reporting, really big one for me. So often you might do something just as simple as visits, daily visits for the financial year. Uh, quick side tip here, Excel doesn't like zeros in line graphs and it used to drive me mad until I worked out how to fix it. So for example, this is visits this financial year. Um, I don't know what happened to the left axis on this, so apologies for that, I only just noticed that today. Uh, but this would essentially run through your financial year and then it will head to zero um, for all days in the future. So side tip here, adjust this to MA to remove the line graph um, that's uh, driving it to zero. And this is the um, uh, that I had in. If the draft is zero, I will statement today's date. Depending on when you run reports and how you might work, you may find that you want to include today's date or you don't want to include today's date. I generally don't, so I've got there, if it's today's date is included, just also set that to NA. And then you get a much nicer graph that looks like this. Uh, my other real favorite is the rolling date um, time period. Now, I usually have to go over this a couple of times to get this right, um, but, it's really good because you can go back weeks, months, years, days forward and work something out. So if you have a, a stakeholder who wants something like a rolling eight week period, this is how you can do it. You can say based on today's date for the current week, and you can see here it says CW, go back eight weeks to the current week minus a day, which will take you to the end of last week. And then you can see here, 
it's going to give you weekly the orders for the last eight weeks. Once you've got that, you can do something cool in Excel um, and you might wanna compare the last four weeks order with the previous four weeks. So this is where Excel and, and Adobe come together really well to do things like this. So you might wanna report that uh, shows that. You can see the graph that I have here. So I don't have much animation in here, but I've just got a few things like this. Uh, so this is my formula of working out. It's a little bit complicated. I'm not going to go through it in too much detail. Um, I, I'm happy to share the actual Excel workbook with anyone who wants because I've got a lot of examples in that. But essentially what it does is it uses the report week start date that we had in that information sheet, looks that up, takes the last four weeks of that and then compares it with four weeks before that. And this is a really easy way of setting up an automatic rolling, you know, eight week report um, that you might need to do. You might have last seven days, you know, everybody depending on their sales cycle or their conversion cycle will have different timeframes here. Third area, build scalable reports. So what you'll often find is you'll start building a report, but then you need to build it slightly differently for a different stakeholder. You may have different countries, you may have different brands, you may have different products. All of these things mean that you might do one report and then have to um, uh, replicate it 10 times. So here are a couple of tips on how I like to do it. First one, when you are building reports quickly, go into offline mode. This is similar to, I'm not sure what, I can't remember what it's called in Excel, but I think it's F9, the calculate on, calculate off button, right? So which you may not want to use. Turn this off when you're creating your reports. What, um, Report Builder will do is it will display the metric as default is zero. You can change it to something like NA, not ready, but it means you can set up all your queries and then run them all at once. Otherwise, for those of you who use Report Builder, you'd realize that every time you set up a new report, it will run that query. And depending on how big your data set, that can take a really long time. Second tip in this area is link to specific cells on your information sheet. So, for example, let's say you just wanted to report on one product because it's for one product manager. Um, and in this case, we've got the unicorn muscle tape. So what you do is you would, um, within Report Builder, you have a couple of different ways of picking something. You can pick it from a range of cells. So in this case, I've just picked one cell. It is possible to pick multiple cells. And I've linked this. This I find much faster than jumping into the Report Builder query either typing Unicorn Muscle Tea or you know you can actually look it up from the list and it will show you the options. This is a much quicker way of doing it than opening and closing um, uh, the report builder queries. Uh, oh, this is just a have a look what it might look like. In here, you'll see it comes up as one specified and then it's just gonna show you the orders for those weeks that we talked about before, the last trailing eight weeks for the Unicorn Muscle Tea. Another uh, recommendation I have um, is around using drop down lists when you might need them. So, um, highly recommend that you type in all the lists. And a lot of people, you know, will have this, you know, they'll have a, a, a drop down and they'll type in all the products available. You might have a subset, you might only have, let's say you work in APAC, you might have Australia and New Zealand, and that person only wants to see those two. You can just add those in here. What you can do is then when you do it for, um, North America, you can then just type over it, do US and Canada, done. So really, really great way of, of doing drop down lists as well. And you can see, you, again, just linking this to the information list. I will talk about this drop down list and what else you can do with it um, shortly. Final uh, tip around scaling, link the chart titles to specific cells. So there's nothing worse than having to go through and updating chart titles. Um, for a long time, I didn't actually know you could do this. Um, so when I found out, this was a bit of a um, game changer for me. So you can link a chart, a, um, a chart title to a cell. So in this case, oops, so come on animation, there it is. Um, let's say somebody's picked the product for Dazzled Thongs. Um, and just, I am in Australia, they're the things you wear on your feet, those thongs, not the other type of thong, which I think means something different in the US. So bedazzled thongs orders for last week. Uh, I've got a couple of little Excel formulas that based on the drop down list will update that chart title. This is one less thing that you have to do if you are replicating or building new reports. 
This is a really, really simple tip, but just to remind people in case you haven't thought about it, bring in external data. Number one use case I have for external data is targets. So you might have visits as a, you know, a, a metric in one of your reports, and then you have targets. I personally not a fan of importing target data into Adobe Analytics. I know a lot of people do, you know, it's personal preference, there's, there's pros and cons, but in Report Builder it makes it really, really easy to have your targets and forecasts as well. I probably should have added that in. And you can then easily create charts with your Adobe data that will update daily and your forecast, well, your, your targets that hopefully don't move around too much during the year and your forecasts that might be weekly, monthly, quarterly, however you do that in your planning cycle. Other ideas around external data to bring into some kind of dashboard, Facebook, Reach, Google Ad Spend, uh, TV audience, depending on um, uh, what, what kind of um, company you're working with, um, match attendance, I've worked with sporting organisations, often pull that into a dashboard. Pretty much anything your boss has asked for, you can probably pull into a report builder, uh, in a report builder workbook. The challenge though, is automating that part of it. You can't always do that. I know Facebook currently does not play well with Microsoft, that integration with Excel, I believe doesn't work at the moment. It used to, it doesn't anymore, really frustrating, but you bring it into your report builder workbook and then at least it's one thing that you don't have to worry about running. You can just come in and import your other data, however you can do that. This, for example, is the, I think the Facebook reach report. This is what it looks like. And you can then easily create a graph that you see below. I've, I've also done some manipulation on this to split organic reach and paid reach. And then you've got a great report like that. Again, none of these numbers have bear anything to do with my company because clearly I don't have 250,000 uh, reach for Facebook. My fifth tip here, um, and I think I'm going pretty good on time. Um, I've just seen what Norm has said around using named ranges in Excel will make the formula less confusing. I will caveat that Norm, I've seen that have be an issue because Report Builder also use named ranges and sometimes they can um, get mixed up. It's probably related to whether, you can't name a range that Report Builder overwrites. So in the case of typing in your own products, um, Norm's exactly right. You can use a named range, but don't name range any of your extracts because things will crash and burn and die. Um, look, I, that was the case years ago. I haven't done anything since, and I believe that's still the case. Make your workbook friendly. So what you may want to do is if you've got a report that you're expecting people to interact with or you want them to refresh themselves, try and make it as easy as possible uh, for them to do that kind of thing. So this is, um, let's just say you've got an operational dashboard and you want people to adjust the report. A um, Couple of things that you could add in here, you can add in a drop down so people can filter or run a different query. I big fan of adding a refresh all button so that people can just click one button to refresh everything. They don't have to worry about the report builder add-in, which can be sometimes a little bit um, scary for some people to use because people are worried they're going to break it. Uh, and also a print PDF or save PDF. Um, this sort of started when I used this a lot when um, Microsoft didn't make it so easy to, to export to PDFs but there's also a couple of advantages. So I'll go through these one by one. So uh, we'll jump to the refresh all button. So some of this has changed a little bit when I jumped back in and had a look. Um, I have links to these macros at the end of the presentation, but a refresh all button is really easy. You can copy this macro as recommended by Adobe and uh, it will essentially do exactly what it does refresh all requests. You can see that in the very last line before the um, function ends. And all that you need to do is add a button in Excel, um, assign the macro and then done. Really, really simple, easy thing. People don't have to worry about the menu, mucking around, it's just there. The next one is adding a macro that will only update part of your extract. So this one, um, the use case I've found for this one is when you might have a report where 
A lot of things are monthly, but certain things could be weekly or daily. So when you run that report, you don't want to update everything because there's no reason to update a monthly report every week. You might only want to, um, but you might have a different chart that you want to update weekly. So what you can do is, again, this macro is, I've got a link to this macro in the back of the presentation. You can set, you can write this macro and you'll see here where it says data extract H1 to J9 in the last line. You can update that to include any ranges that you want to update. So if you've got a lot of data, um, this can save you a lot of time where you're only updating things that you need to update. So in this case, for example, we're just updating the, mac the, the macro. So um, that is attached to the, to the product drop-down list. Sorry, I'm trying to think about talking about this sequentially. So you've got a drop-down list. First thing you'll do is you'll pick a new a product and then you would add this macro and it would refresh and update the report. Just a side note here, um, there are other ways of doing things and often with Excel and Report Builder, it's like six of one and half a dozen of the other and it depends on the way you look at things. Another option is you can have a macro that downloads, for example, all of the products. So our unicorn muscle tea, our bedazzled thongs, and then you can use a drop down just to filter it in your report. So there's different ways of doing it depending on uh, the nature of your business. Uh, final one here is make common tasks easier. Uh, look, this is something I wrote a long, a long time ago uh, and there's probably easier ways of doing this, but essentially this was to print out the PDF um, or sort of save the PDF. So one of the things that will often happen with these kind of reports is people will want to make a PDF out of it. Um, and so the easier you can make this, uh, the more likely that your report's gonna be used. So for example, this was just a really simple thing. Um, and what it did is saved the file and it came up with the saving box. So you could choose where you wanted to save it. You could actually force that to save in a certain folder if you wanted to. And in this case, it was coming up with criticality and then the worksheet name and then the report. Uh, I used to actually set up quite a few of these with the date. So it would start with the date of when it was last run. Sometimes it would start with the date of the last week of data and then it might be, um, so the date, uh, criticality, weekly summary report. And then if people wanted to adjust the uh, file name, they could, but they didn't have to. And so the easy, just again, the easier you can make these things, uh, the better for a lot of people. So have a think about what your uh, users want and how they use the reports uh, or how you would like them to use the reports and make stuff as easy as possible for them. All right. Final one, make your reports look on point. Make your reports look good. There is nothing worse than an ugly spreadsheet. It can have the best data in the world. If it's ugly, I guarantee you people won't trust that data as much as they trust the nice data that might come from your agency partner. So simple things to do. Use your logo and color palette. Uh, set up a theme in Excel. Like I can't stress this enough. If you're gonna do a lot of reports, set up a theme. That'll give you colors and fonts um, and make it really, really easy to brand your reports. Doesn't have to be fancy. Um, but what it will do, it will make your reports look really professional. This is probably the biggest tip I've actually, um, I've noticed someone I used to work with on the chat at the moment. Hi, Michael. Um, he'll probably know. The worst thing is if you have an Excel report and you get, you open it up, you need to print it out. I guarantee you people need to print out your reports. Not everyone is paperless or they need to print it to a PDF. They might print it to a PDF because they're going to look at it and not iPad. Your report might get sent to your manager. It then might get sent to your manager's manager and then your manager's manager, they try and print it out and they can't. So don't do that. It will make this bare thing sad. This is my only animation on here and I've refrained from putting caps on my presentation as well. You see here, this doesn't report, this doesn't print correctly. Make sure it looks, um, it's in a suitable format to print. That means if you're in Australia, make sure it's in A4. If you're, I think in the US, it might be letter format. Uh, decide if you want it to be landscape or portrait.
but whatever it is, make sure that when you go to print it originally, it prints nicely. Um, put the um, first couple of rows to print on every page so people know where they are. Make sure the stuff labeled. Um, I cannot stress this enough because there is nothing more annoying than trying to print out a report that looks like the one on the left. Um, another tip here that we have, stay on time, yep, remove unnecessary distractions and lock it down. So if you've got a report which you don't, you built really well and you don't really expect anybody to play around with, look at lock, locking it down. So you can remove the grid lines, you can remove the formula bar, you can remove the headings. Uh, you can hide the, the sheets that are running everything behind so you just have the summary sheet. Uh, you can also lock the, um, the report builder plugin as well, uh, add in so that you know people don't accidentally stuff things up. Uh, now to do this though, you, your report has to be built really, really well. You, you wanna make sure that people don't feel the need to go in and change things. And this will make a, a big difference to how it looks. Now it looks like I've got probably just enough time to run through just a couple of tips around scheduling workbooks. So you can schedule workbooks to be sent out. Um, they can be sent out as PDFs, Excel, CSV, uh, I believe now there's a Power BI um, schedule. So that's a really great way if you want to send a report out on a Monday morning for the previous week. Um, and I've used it a lot in, in my work. There are some tips though that I kind of wanted to go through. So first one, you can't schedule a workbook with a macro in it. So macros are great for a report that you're building that you your users are going to interact with. They're reports that you're going to expect them to run themselves perhaps on Monday, or they need to look at it every day to look at the numbers from yesterday. Um, so, in, you know, people who are familiar with Excel and can run these reports. Um, if this is just a report that you're going to send out as a PDF on Monday morning and it's going to be flat, no macros. Um, so you really just need to decide on what the purpose of your report is and your stakeholder group. Um, Avoid using today or some of the other time Excel functions in the query. So when I spoke about the fact before you can link to a query, you can link queries to a cell in Excel, cell in Excel. Um, try if you can not to use some of those date functions. They go a little bit weird overnight. You could be in different time zones if you've got like um, uh, people in London and New York and Sydney, for example. So try and make sure if you can to use the, the Adobe presets for your queries. Doesn't mean you can't use the actual formulas that I showed you around doing the, um, the four week comparisons in your workbook. Um, that's, 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 okay. that's totally fine. Uh, file size limit is five megabytes. I believe it's still five. It's been five for a really long time. I don't think Adobe's done a lot of updating on Report Builder. Um, there was a question here around, is Adobe still supporting? Um, uh, maybe we can have a look at that one a little bit later. I'm not 100% sure, um, but their, their file size limit is still five megabytes. Don't schedule more reports from your account more than about five to 10 at the same time. So you, you schedule it for a time. Um, if you've got, let's say you've got 100 reports, and I, I, I do know people who have this, don't schedule them all at the same time, schedule like, you know, 10 one hour and 10 another hour and 10 another hour because they do start to get um, held up in the back end and can cause you all sorts of problems. Hopefully though, you don't have a hundred workbooks to schedule because then I think you're probably really, really busy. Um, and the other one I really like on the scheduling reports is use the custom functions for subject and file names. So I'm a big one about, I'm, I'm a big fan, sorry, an advocate of putting dates in things. I'm also an advocate of going year, month, date, because when you do that for a subject, you can sort within Outlook, probably a lot of big companies still using Outlook. You can sort within your email program and that will come up in the date order. If you use the standard US date, which is month, date, year, um, kind of falls apart when you move over years. And if you use the Australian date, date, month, year, that also doesn't work. So. Um, a tip here I always use to say is to use the year and the month and the date. And you can use that both in the file name, also helps when you're storing, storing files on your drive, and also for subjects when you run reporting. Uh, that is pretty much it. I think I did that pretty well in time, Adam. Um, hopefully I didn't talk too fast. I have been accused of that a lot, talking fast and talking a lot. 
but this gives us um, probably a good 15 minutes to go through any sort of um, QA. So, um, Adam, I'm not sure where we go from here. Yep. Can we just yep. jump I in? Will, and have uh... a look? Yeah, so um, we do have a lot of questions who that have uh, piled in. So I've been kind of looking at those. If anyone on the call has questions, uh, please go to the Zoom Q&A and post your questions now. Even if we don't have time to get to them, uh, I can download all the questions from Zoom later. Uh, okay, perfect. So a couple of things that did come up that I'll take care of housekeeping. So uh, everyone seems to want a copy of your spreadsheet. So okay, um, cool. I yep. assume that you can post that to the SDEC Slack group uh, later or sometime after. So um, yes, if you have any type absolutely. of thing that shows some of the sample formulas, that would be great. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna just kind of power through some of these questions. Uh, they're kind of all over the place. Um, we've had some people who've been helping out with the answers and Excellent. I think, I think right. I'm going to recruit Norm uh, for the next session on Report Builder since Norm's been uh, actively typing away here. So- <laughs> Thanks, Norm. The, the big question that we get a lot um, is again, is this Windows only? Uh, people like me who use a Mac. My experience has always been that um, I've used Report Builder by running parallels on a Mac because it only works on Windows. Um, I believe that is still the case. Norm put in the system requirements. So I do believe unless you know something, yes. I don't know, Christy, it is only Windows. Yes, uh, it is only Windows. So I know I, um, I'm not a Mac person, know nothing about them, don't like to use them. Um, but my understanding is that you have to use some sort of like Windows emulator or something to make that work, like to, to run Report Builder on a Mac. Um, I know it's come up a lot with Adobe and that probably does come back to does Adobe still support Report Builder? Um, look, I think from a product features or a roadmap, no, I don't believe they've really added anything into Report Builder for a while. But it is still, my understanding is still actually a reported, a supported resource at the moment. Um, however, with everything changing, um, you know, I know there's talk about the the different uh, reporting API for analytics. Um, I don't know how long they'll keep supporting it as such. Um, but as far as Mac goes, I know you know people were asking about it for a lot, and I don't think there's any plans to to support it on a Mac. Yeah, and there's some people who have posted in the Q&A area that they've just had some problems, like they have to reinstall, you know, Microsoft Office, and, you know, there's another comment about it being buggy. So, you know, <laughs> Report Builder has always been notorious as being something yeah. that's a little bit buggy. And what's funny, I've always found that there's like this small but very passionate, devoted group to Report Builder. I think Adobe would yeah. love to just kill this thing off, but yeah. there are just people who really love it. So um, yeah. I think when it comes to bugs and all that stuff, all you have to do, you really just have to kind of yell at Adobe, call support, and, you know, it's kind of like the squeaky wheel gets the <laughs> grease there. But um, I don't know, like, to your point, how long Adobe is going to support it. Um, yeah. I would imagine that their main goal, especially with the Adobe Experience platform, is going to be to get you to just push data into the platform and just use analysis workspace. But again, you can you know, we don't have answers to that. You have to really ask uh, Adobe yeah. with that. And, you know, you could probably, you know, find out, uh, you know, that's a good question to ask during Summit. But yeah. they haven't really, a lot of people are asking, are there updates? And like, you know, some people are saying that the UI hasn't changed in two years, five no. years. Have you seen any changes recently? No, I, look, I haven't seen anything updated on this. So I I, I gave a, pre, a, a, a lab at Summit a couple of, Oh, I don't know, it's weird now. All the time seems the same. I think it was two years ago now, um, in person, um, with Report Builder. Um, I couldn't really see anything to change much since then. Um, yeah, I don't I don't think Adobe's doing any work. Um, you know, as people have reported, is it buggy? Unfortunately, absolutely. Um, I often, one of the tips I often, when I'm sort of halfway through building one, I'll often copy, copy it and keep going because sometimes I've had, it's easier just to start from scratch with the report builder when things go awry. So there's certainly things that are buggy. Um, but I would say the, the benefit of something like report builder, you know, any large corporate environment, I guarantee you people are still using Excel. It's a, Excel is still an awesome tool. Um, yeah. So, you know, being able to 
persevere with it. Um, I agree. I think Adobe would like to kill it off and would like you to put all their stuff within their systems, but that's not realistic, right? It's not going to happen. Um, and the simplicity of Excel about just being able to pull something in there to, you know, for example, uh, bringing in match attendance from, from a sport, you just quickly type it in and your report's updated, right? Like, you know, I'm not going to put that into a CSV, then go in and upload it into Adobe for something like that. It's not made for that. Um, so Report Builder is great when you're bringing in lots of different types of information together. But, um, you know, I think I'm um, just having a look. Ali has said is limited with, with file size. Like, I don't think their file size has changed in five, ten years maybe, you know, on what you can upload into Report Builder. So there's some of those kind of things that you have yeah. to be wary of when you're doing scheduled reports. But, you know, you can not have scheduled reports and just have more user-friendly reports that, that a user can open themselves every Monday and just run it quickly themselves. That's also another option. Okay, cool. So let me just, I'm going to power through just in the interest of time. We've got a lot of smaller yep. questions here. So yep, we'll do sure. kind of a power round with quick answers. Um, <laughs> John was asking, has anyone noticed performance differences between using Adobe's rolling dates versus uh, the date from cell where Excel calculates it. So I don't know if Christy, if you've seen that. I don't, look, I don't know. Uh, look, to be honest, being in Australia, a lot of our data sets are not nearly as big as some of the stuff in, you know, that you get out of the US and, and Europe. Um, I would probably recommend using the Adobe data, uh, the Adobe ranges when you can because it's sort of like, it seems like it's one less step to pull down that data. And, and, and there, you know, with the uh, rolling dates and you can use current week, um, and there is a link in the back of this presentation to what all that means. Um, it is pretty flexible. So I think it would hopefully solve most of your use cases. So I don't know for sure, but my, my gut feel is that, yes, it's probably more reliable to do it that way. Okay. Um, one comment, uh, Hans had put in a comment that said, by the way, lots of requests could be saved by using the new Excel filter functions. So I haven't played yeah. around with that, but Hans, if you uh, have more information on that, yeah. um, you could post that in the Slack group. I don't know if Christy, if you've played around with that. Yeah, look, I think with filters, it's, I just wanted to show people different ways of kind of doing things. Um, and there might be data restrictions for some people, or you're quickly building out different workbooks. Um, and for example, people might not have access to certain products, which is why I showed kind of like the product example of just pulling that product down. Um, but you can have a request that builds all the products and then filter them. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot of different ways of getting the data that you need. And it's going to completely depend on your stakeholder group and what data they want to see, need to see, allowed to see. Yep. Uh, next question is, have you explored Power BI and the Adobe Analytics connectors to the APIs as a replacement for Report Builder? I'm wondering what the API limits are that you can do with Report Builder. And before you answer, there were a couple of people who commented, said Power BI will not display classification data. That's a Microsoft issue. And uh, Hans had said that he'd like to have an SDEC session on the API Excel integration. And we actually are, our next uh, session, our next Adobe Analytics session is talking all about the new uh, 2.0 APIs. I don't, it won't be Excel focused, but I think that that session yeah, might yeah. be a good lead into that. So. Uh, going back to the original question, Power BI and Adobe Analytics, I don't know if you've played around with that yet, Christy. I played, I don't have any current knowledge on this. I don't have a client that's using Power BI, you know, very much at the moment. But I, when it first came out, I played around um, a lot with this. And this might be the wrong thing to say in an Adobe session, but I got so annoyed with, with it. I started bringing my Adobe data into Google Data Studio. Um, so I think, look, I think if, if, if you're working in a company that uses a lot of Power BI, it's certainly something to have a look at and see how, how it works. Um, I'm not so familiar with it. Um, I, I just do a, a lot of work with Report Builder within Excel. Um, but look, I think working on that, Microsoft, some of the other big things possible. And then in general, um, just around the reporting API, um, I'll just go back up on my, one of the other things I had in here was next steps, just a couple of interesting links. Um, this might be slightly outdated with the new one coming up, but there is a really good tutorial using Report Builder to learn the Adobe Analytics API. So if, you, if you're like me and you've come from more of the business side rather than more the developer tech data science side, 
this is a really good way of kind of trying to understand how report you build a kind of just is a front end to using the API. There's also um, a link in here of publishing to Power BI. Um, so that's another thing that you could look at. And um, down the bottom here is a way of importing data from an external data source into Excel, which is where I noticed that the Facebook support has been dropped slash not working at the moment. So um, I, look, I, it's there. I believe it does work, um, but I, I couldn't give you a good answer on that one right now. Okay. And then in the same vein, uh, someone had asked about integrating Adobe Analytics with Salesforce and Tableau. Um, I know that there is a Tableau integration with Adobe Analytics, but it's more for data warehouse where you can basically dump data out yeah. of Adobe Analytics and into Tableau. But I don't believe there's any type of stuff related to Report Builder in Tableau, correct? No. Yeah. Look, I mean, I, I know that Adobe Analytics added support for Tableau. Oh. I'm going to take a guess here about three years ago. It could be out by plus or minus 100%. Um, but uh, for sort of downloading files to Tableau, as far as an integration, oh, not last time I looked at that, but, uh, you know, probably quick Google search could have a look at that. And it was around Salesforce. No, I don't think there is a direct one. I mean, that's yep. kind of more like bypassing Report Builder, I guess. Um, but, you know, you can use Data, data Warehouse is a fantastic tool for getting data out of Adobe Analytics to use probably in, in, in those kind of situations. Report Builder is great for exactly what it says. I think building reports. And a lot of people are asking if they can get these links in your slides, but I'm assuming you're okay po posting your slides to the Slack group afterwards, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Happy to do this. It's all set up. Um, and also I the spreadsheet, I just need to quickly go through and make sure there's nothing in there that shouldn't be in there, which is why yep. I haven't got it quite ready yet, Adam, but I'll certainly- um, Okay, yeah, no hurry. That one, um, uh, and then we had a couple, two people asking about macros. One said, where can we get the macros and where can we find the macros you show in the beginning? Are those all in the spreadsheet that you're going to be sharing? Uh, yes, they'll be in the spreadsheet and they'll also be in, uh, the Adobe ones are in, uh, there's a link in the bot in the back, which is um, to those macros as well. So uh, you'll be able to get, get those ones for sure. Um, a couple of people were talking about named ranges. So Norm was saying, FYI, yep. using name ranges in Excel will make the VLOOKUP formulas less confusing. Yep. Yep. And then someone else said, yeah, but we get issues with name ranges yep. uh, because <laughs> Report Builder overwrites yeah. and breaks formulas. So I don't know if there's yeah. anything you want to I talk mean, about that. Yeah. yeah, in my actual kind of long, longer form training, I talk about that. So, so, so name Excel report builder uses named ranges in a lot of things. Um, and which is generally why I stay away, away from them full stop. So you can't name a range of an extract because it will all break. Um, I believe like for the example, if you're, you're creating a dropdown that is independent of report builders queries, that should be fine. Um, I, I think from memory, I had an issue with that one, so I just never did it again. Um, it could have been another issue. It could have just been some weird bug in Report Builder that we're all aware of. So yeah, you certainly don't want to name any ranges that cross over with an extract, or for example, if you're linking to a cell in the Report Builder query, um, name ranges will cause it to break. Yep. Okay, well, what I think I'm going to propose is that you and Norm get together and do a <laughs> follow up session, which is the advanced version of this, where I want to definitely see dependent queries, because that's one of my favorite parts is where you basically yep. build a data block that is then dependent on another data block. Yep, yep, uh, that's yep. where I think it gets <laughs> really, really cool. So I'm going to uh, have you and Norm in the Slack group start pinging each other. And then in you know, a couple of weeks, we want to do the Report Builder 2.0. Um, oh. Ali had put a note here, and I'm not sure when he posted this. It may have made sense at the time, but now I'm losing the context where he said, we need a system to schedule refreshes in place. But that may make more sense to you than me right now. Yeah, um, I don't know if you can do that, but I think you can, I mean, you can schedule like a, a workbook, like with a macro to, to refresh automatically. Um, in fact, I think I've even seen an Adobe post um, on that. I'll just look that one up and maybe I can add it to the slide. So you, I, I'm not sure if that's what Ali meant, but okay. um, you know, where it will either automatically refresh on open or based on the time. Um, so I think I'll, I'll add that to, uh, to the, um, 
uh, links I have at the back of the slide. And, and Ali, hopefully that's what you mean. But yeah, and he just uh, put a link. Yeah. In, he just put a link in the chat if you want, in okay. the Q and A. But yes. um, we are at time. So the good news is, is I'm leaving on a positive note. Uh, Caval says, I saw something in a recent Adobe session, I can't see, remember where, with a screenshot for an upgrade to report builder. So I oh. will believe that when I see that, but I'm trusting yeah, you, I'm Caval. Sorry, Caval. <laughs> you haven't convinced me at all. Um, oh, he, no, he says he's got it in front of him. So uh, maybe yeah, Caval, share that in the, fantastic. share that I in the Slack yeah. group. Yeah, yeah, maybe share that in the Slack group. Um, oh, but anyway, I clearly knows something that that we we all don't know, and 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 yeah, if, if that's true, about you know PC Mac, then you know I think there'd be a lot of happy people. Um, so that would be great, and and Adam, maybe that's a whole other um, session yeah. as well. Cool. Well, thank you everyone for joining, and Christy, once again, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to share some information with us. Um, it's great having people like you from the group to uh, to share. Cool. No problems. I, if I can do just a little quick plug, um, Adam, if this is all right. Um, there's a great Aussie startup called Kintel who is looking at doing, um, I'm trying to support them, sort of like a, almost like an air tasker of consulting knowledge. So if anyone is in, has any questions for me or anything like that, happy to do like a follow-up session to this for free. Um, so have a check out Kintel. I've got a link there. Um, and yeah, they're a great little Aussie startup that is looking to kind of change the way we um, share some information. So if that plug's not good, Adam, cut it from the um, video. That's fine too. No, no worries, no worries. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for joining. I know it's a crazy time for you and thanks everyone else for joining a little bit later than normal to accommodate uh, the time zone. So yes, um, thank you everybody. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.